what are the relationships between the women and the gurus like because for argument's sake quite often it's it's pointed out that guru har gobind sahib ji had more than one wife guru gobind singh ji had more than one wife etc like how does how do pre-colonial texts deal with that considering from a, a more modern post Singh Sabha movement it would be it's viewed almost as blasphemous or controversial or kind of somewhere on that scale so this is an important question i think uh, it's it uh, behooves us to think about this carefully uh, because the pre-colonial sources also talked about this very carefully so we know if we're going to take uh, our history seriously meaning if we're going to believe the pre-colonial sources and they all state that Guru Har Gobind had multiple wives, Guru Gobind Singh Ji had multiple wives, Guru Har Rai as well, etc. So how do we think about this? And if we look to how uh, Kavi Suntok Singh wrote about this in Suraj Prakash, when Guru Har Gobind, Guru Har Gobind is the first uh, guru to have multiple wives. And on uh, the occasion of his second marriage and his third marriage, Kavi Suntok Singh writes, the poet writes that um, essentially this is the re this is the tradition of Maharaja of great kings. And in the same way that Guru Hargobind and the previous gurus had grasped tightly to Piri, a spiritual authority, they had also now grasped to Miri, uh, a royalty or sovereignty authority as well. So in regard to that, they're also playing the games that are associated with that, which is building connections with other communities. So for example, one of the wives of um, Guru Hargobind, her name is Mata Morvahi. And that is actually not her real name. Marwahi is just the name of her clan of the Marwars, right? Uh, her name is actually Mahan Devi. So uh, what can we derive from that? We can think of Guru Hargobind as marrying into other clans to build connections as other Raji are doing as well, right? Uh, so it's very much in that light of, of kind of extending uh, sovereignty, extending uh, the influence uh, of Sikhi across different lands as well. Um, and because, you know, this becomes a tradition, that's how people actually, that's how poets like Santok Singh and other pre-colonial texts, Mani Singh, etc., are conveying those uh, types of marriages that, you know, this is representative of the Miri path, of uh, the path of royalty, of sovereignty. So that's how they have understood uh, that tradition no i just wondered i guess also it comes back to what you were saying about like narratives are suppressed and i guess to some degree just like we're trying to make sense of it like the things of when they're kind of almost like reimagining these narratives don't really have the words to be able to kind of understand it themselves and then explain it without being like actually this doesn't make sense so let's just throw it out the window and just say it's nothing to do with us whereas i guess the work you're doing with the artwork that simon and others are helping with it's actually bringing those stories back out and going, here you are, like, have a look at it. What do the pre-colonial texts say about marriage rights? So there's this kind of common perception or perhaps misperception, like, correct me if I'm wrong, that the modern Anand garage is something that evolved after the Gurus um, and that during the times of the Gurus, it wasn't what we now have as the Anand garage around the Guru Granth Sahib Ji, etc. Um, from what you've read in the research you've done, what do the pre-colonial sources say about this? The marriage rights associated with the Guru Hargobin and, and the different Matama. Um, this is just correct that the way in which they got married uh, during that time, as evidenced through the pre-colonial sources, depict a different way than how we do marriages today. And that shouldn't shock listeners. Uh, these traditions have evolved over time. Just like during that time, we had the Masand uh, kind of uh, administration. There were masans that were handling uh, different congregations. That was a system that was set up by Guru Amar Dashi and it got taken down by Guru Gomez Singh. So things evolve, they change over time. And the version that we have now, the Anand Karaj that we have today, is more of a recent um, tradition that the Pant has collectively agreed upon, and that's totally fine. There's only a few people that do it uh, in a different way nowadays, Namtaris uh, being one of them. Um, but it is not uncommon for our grandparents, I remember my grandparents telling me that they knew many people that had what they call a bedi via, meaning uh, a wedding around fire, which is how the pre-colonial texts talk about uh, the way in which Guru Hargobind had his marriages, uh, and even up to Guru Gomasing's time. Uh, if you look at 
even the paintings associated with Guru Nanak Dev Ji's wedding, uh, you'll see in Baba Tal, these are also the ways uh, that Guru Nanak Dev Ji and the other gurus had their wedding rites. But what's interesting is in the pre-colonial texts, when they're talking about these traditions, it always says very, and this is kind of gives us clues as to how people at that time uh, thought about these wedding rites. It says, Kol Kirit, that these are the traditions of their lineage. So in a sense that, yeah, they were just performing whatever rites that uh, their family would have performed. This is not to say that this is a Gursik way to do it. It's just to say that they were doing it according to that family. Later on, more traditions evolved uh, where Gursik are saying, okay, the wedding should be done uh, in uh, uh, this prescribed manner, which was different from before. So the fact that the old stories mention uh, wedding rites being different, it shouldn't uh, it shouldn't make us feel uncomfortable. It shouldn't shock us. Uh, traditions evolve over time, uh, and that's not abnormal.